Which of us will strike out against our families, neighbors, strangers, or politicians? That no one can tell in advance. And no one in our country seriously thinks that anyone who is different, who excites suspicion from neighbors or even the police, should be detained or treated against his will. The 1980s mental illness conversation becomes more complicated when addressing the kinds of crimes and harm that were being linked to the neglect of disorders, especially schizophrenia, manic depression, and PTSD. The decade started with the murder of John Lennon in New York by a disturbed fan named Mark David Chapman. Years later, he would blame his wife, who he is still married to, saying she didn't go to somebody, even the police, and say, look, my husband's bought a gun and he says he's gonna kill John Lennon. Chapman had multiple past suicide attempts and had been admitted to a hospital hospital for heavy depression and was a heavy drinker. PTSD and depression were especially pertinent in the 1984 case of Tyrone Mitchell, a 28-year-old who had been 22 years old when his five younger siblings and both his parents were murdered and or died by suicide during the Jonestown massacre at the hands of notorious cult leader Jim Jones. Mitchell suffered a nervous breakdown and began using PCP with his behavior becoming increasingly erratic. In the six years after the Jonestown massacre, he discharged weapons and harassed neighbors with no help or consequences. On February 24th, 1984, he shot and killed two people at a Los Angeles elementary school and injured 12 others, mostly children, before dying by suicide. He was legally sober at the time. Sadly, that was not the last school shooting of the decade. A man named Patrick Purdy killed five people and injured 32 others, mostly Southeast Asian immigrants at Cleveland Elementary in Stockton, California in 1989. Journalists from around the nation crowded near a Stockton police captain's today as he revealed new details about yesterday's unexplainable massacre. It turns out this killing field was once Purdy's own playground. He attended Cleveland Elementary School from kindergarten through third grade and once lived on American Avenue nearby. Much was made about Purdy being an alcoholic, cocaine addict, and mentally disturbed. Michael Jackson would visit the school in the weeks that followed in a flurry of news reporting. The killing machine was this AK-47 with bayonet. Carved into the barrel was the word Hezbollah, the name of an Iranian terrorist group. There were also the words freedom and victory. On ammo clips were other slogans, including evil and humanoids. As a result, California enacted a ban on assault rifles that didn't serve a sporting purpose. This teeny bit of legislation would be the exception nationwide, not the rule, and would be ensnared in arguments about gun control in the future. It's hard to not wonder if some lives could have been saved five years earlier when 41-year-old James Huberty, a conspiracy theorist and survivalist, fatally shot 21 people and injured 19 others at a San Isidro McDonald's in San Diego. These images are more of war than of a small fast food restaurant in San Isidro. Yet it was a local man dressed in battle fatigues who declared, I have killed a thousand, I'm gonna kill a thousand more. 41-year-old James Huberty reportedly walked into the restaurant carrying a semi-automatic rifle and two other weapons, enough ammunition to last two hours. Witnesses inside said he fired wildly into the unsuspecting crowd gathered for a quick evening meal. He fired through windows, hitting people in the street. He fired at men, women, children, and babies. Huberty's weapons include a shotgun, a pistol, and an Uzi. For years, Huberty had been abusive to his family and freaked acquaintances out with his obsession with guns. A week before his killing spree, he lost his job. Three days before, he tried obtaining an appointment at a San Diego mental health clinic, but didn't get a return phone call. Mr. Huberty called the clinic and was asked uh, a series of five questions, which are typical screening questions, and uh, answered all his questions in the negative and did not want to speak about his problem and uh, was told that he would be called back for an appointment uh, within a day or two and uh, that was the nature of the telephone conversation which happened of course the day before the event. I think the mental health clinic should consider if a person takes the time to call a mental health clinic they definitely have a problem. I mean most people there's a stigma connected to calling for mental help. That's a last ditch effort when you call a mental health clinic. 
Most of the victims in the McDonald's were Mexican American. Huberty's wife, who would later ludicrously sue McDonald's and James's former employer, claimed that he wasn't a racist, but a Nazi. She said he thought he was German, but he wasn't. He acted like he was German. Worsening the tragedy, within two days, McDonald's was preparing to reopen the location right after employee funerals, which prompted over 1,000 local and 30,000 global signatures on a petition to close the location and open a memorial park. Disgustingly, tourists were arriving from as far away as D.C. and London to pose for pictures in front of the restaurant. McDonald's agreed to tear down the building, which was replaced by a memorial. James Huberty, who was shot and killed by a sniper rifle 77 minutes into his rampage, had suffered a mental breakdown before. The previous winter, he told a police officer he was a war criminal. Instead of being assessed and taken to a mental hospital, he was interviewed at a federal building at the Tijuana border, found to have no military service whatsoever, and then set free. Recalled a co-worker of his growing delusions, he talked about the end of the world. He and his family were going to be the only ones left. He talked about going off into the woods. Huberty, in the two years before the massacre, was in a perpetual downward financial spiral and lost his job. These are not excuses, but still an important reminder of the connections between economic insecurity and violence in a capitalist society. And what about the main arena of capitalism, the workplace? Good evening. Here's what's happening. At first, everybody thought it was a joke. Somebody's setting off firecrackers in the post office at Edmond, Oklahoma, outside Oklahoma City. But soon it became clear that it wasn't a joke at all. It was a massacre. The 1986 Edmond Post Office shooting in Oklahoma embodied the most extreme convergence of poor mental health and poor working conditions in a country with easy gun access. After Marine veteran Patrick Sherrill killed 14 people, including one of two supervisors who had reprimanded him the day before, the term going postal was coined. The event sparked discourse about the state of the United States postal system, which had recently been drained of federal money and was alleged to be overworking its employees. A 1989 postal shooting in Escondido, California, further gave legs to the idea of going postal, and more post office shootings would follow in the 90s. In 1989 in Louisville, Kentucky, a man who had been seeking psychiatric treatment since the late 70s, named Joseph T. Westbecker, killed eight people and injured 12 others at his former place of employment while on Prozac, which his family would claim contributed to his behavior. In 1984, five years before he took Prozac, Westbecker's medical records showed that he had attempted suicide 12 to 15 times, as well as confessed to a psychiatrist that he thought about harming his job foreman. Prozac at the time of the shooting was being touted as a miracle happy pill that would balance depression and anxiety. In 1987, the same year that the nation was fighting a costly war against predominantly black users of street drugs, the popular, mainly white, mainly middle class antidepressant was approved by the FDA. Sales of Prozac were $350 million within a year, and arguments about the drug's side effects, like suicidal ideation and dependence, would follow. 